And the title of the chapter, A Russian Pilgrimage. Yes. In August 2004. And I had just reread the chapter. But you start the chapter with, it is not unusual for those people who seek a deeper communion with God to distance themselves from their fellows to pray silent and alone. And that really speaks to me. And I think a lot of your viewers too, they're in this um, dichotomy of being in the world, but wanting to slowly be less in the world. Yes. So there's this pull. I thought maybe you could talk a little bit more about that, this, this transition that kind of happens naturally from distancing yourself from the world and how to, how to move through that when you still very much connected to family and maybe a job, life. I first read about um, this sort of thing. I must have been quite young maybe even at school, uh, and uh, it appealed to me enormously, not being, not being a very social boy. And um, so I, I, I loved the, the idea of that. I read about hermits up in the Himalayas or in the desert, and I guess that appealed to me in no the end. Um, I was rather disappointed when, at the age of 26, I went to a school of meditation in London and was told that our way is the way of the householder. I didn't really want that. I wanted to, the way of the, of the um, recluse, the extreme. I wanted, I was all for the hair shirt in those days. I wanted to be told to, you know, walk around the world on my hands and knees, that sort of thing. <laughs> I was always a sucker for punishment. <laughs> and um, so I was slightly disappointed to be sort of um, not to get that with my meditation. But um, <clears throat> we were told the way of the householder. But as the years have passed, I've come to be grateful. Um, but by long, long tradition, there is, of course, in all, all religions, the, the, uh, the way of the recluse. Um, there is a time on and uh, one might think that's a, that's a more effective way of getting close to God. Um, after a lifetime's experience, I'm not at all sure that it is really. I think I was very fortunate to be told that I've got to continue a worldly life and, and uh, integrate meditation with it, um, which is the way I have lived my life. Although I've, uh, I've never been a very social man, I was a farmer for the first part of my life and I've spent many years in solitary, even desert places. I've always, I've never, I've always been a rather solitary sort of man, um, even though functioning in the world. Um, so that, that's it, there are two traditional ways. In this um, chapter, you write about um, the monks from, and I, I apologize, I probably am going to not pronounce these Russian yes, of course. places correctly, but um, Coming to Solovki, Solovki, is that how you say it? Solovki, Solovki, that's right. Solovki, yeah. And what started as a simple hermitage developed into the greatest monastic fortress and administrative center of north, northwest Russia. Yes, yes, correct, yes. Yes, yes. It, it, it was the most impressive place. It was built out of gigantic boulders which weren't cut into um into convenient shapes for building there was an art in 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 somehow dragging these great sea washed round or oval shaped boulders up from the sh shore and somehow fitting them together 
which is uh, which created these walls around this hugely impressive um, ancient fortification, which uh, gone through many many centuries and uh, and uh, in the early part of the last century was taken over by the communists and converted into one of these uh, extermination camps um, to exterminate priests and, and, and members of the church because it was communist policy to annihilate religion because you know, religion uh, presents people with the authority of God, whereas uh, communism, um, the idea of communism was that man, or rather the man, Lenin or whoever was top dog in the communist hierarchy, uh, um, called the shots. And it was said to him that uh, it was really a substitution of man for God, really, that's what communism was all about. Um, well, for many years they they, they tried, and uh, and and as the, as the church was the opposition, they had to somehow get rid of all the, the clergy, didn't they? And there were close on a million were uh, transported up to this remote part in northern Russia, and put through horrific uh, labour, uh, working in these forests where apart from the cold in winter in summer the anybody is you wouldn't believe the ferocity of the insect life or, or just uh, south of the tundra they literally eat you alive these creatures but when i was there myself in another part of russia soon after i arrived at a village uh, where actually my mother used to live when she was a little girl one of the village children had strayed into the forest and got lost and they found her a few days later just eaten, eaten to death, bitten to death by the insects. It's not uncommon. They very strictly uh, advise you to be careful when you go. Keep your, you know, if you look at ancient paintings of Russian, Russian working in the fields in the summer, they don't roll their sleeves up, they keep them down. <laughs> mm. So uh, that was sort of key, and uh, oh God, all, all the nightmare. Oh dear me, I couldn't tell you what awful stories they told us when we were there about what happened. God, we would start cutting off their fingers. They'd gamble at night and set desperate us cut off their one knuckle after another. That's how they would bet. Well, <laughs> when life gets to that sort of pitch, you can guess. My God, what happened? What man can do to man is unbelievable. When life gets that desperate. So that's what happened to all those bishops and from the yeah, from the bishops downwards down to the devoted monks and nuns. It seems like history repeats it itself so much, you know, around things like that. I look, I think of the Tibetan people that yeah, uh, all the monasteries that got destroyed, and, and that Absolutely. is still going on. Mm -hmm. Yes, history does repeat itself. It's extraordinary, isn't it? People always think these dreadful things are. Yeah, you know, like after the first, world, second world, first and second world war, there were movement. United Nations, for example, was something to end wars, wasn't it? But we never learn. There's something about um, interesting words of Jesus that uh, we'll always have wars, like the poor, we'll always have them with us. It's, it's, it's all really a consequence of sin. I, I, have, to, I have to come on to that later on in this chapter, because how else can you explain these things? We have to come back to the whole predicament of man and what man is and why these things happen. We've got to get back to the basic cause of it all. Otherwise, you just can tell horror stories without end about the effects. But, um, those of us of a more inquiring mind want to get to this cause. Why? Why does it happen?
you write on chapter on page 222, what causes us to rise up against our brethren. The question is as old as history. And it seems a part of pilgrimage that we all have to answer for ourselves. And then you, yeah. you touch on the monster you call pride. Yes, yes. And, and, and there's this one sentence where you write, what is the basic pride? What is the basic pride? Well, the basic, the basic pride, I can't remember what I wrote here, but but it's um yes that, that that we set ourselves up as separate from God. We we turn away wrote. we That's turn away wrote. from God. This is the basic sin. And so we end up separate, and uh, hence this Pandora's pop box of of less and less fortunate circumstances we turn away we leave home we leave our natural spiritual home and fall into what we call mortality subject to death and you know we build up all sorts of stories to justify our doing this um, that we can make the world a better place and do it our way. I suppose every when you think of the children these days, everybody wants to leave home, don't they, and set up on their own. It used to be the boys that did that. Most of the girls were stay at home. Now it's both boys and girls who want to leave home and go their own way. That's it, really. Is it a good thing to do? No. Debatable, isn't it? I think I was part encouraged, part uh, that wanted to, to join the family business, but I thought I knew better. You know, we think we can to, to, to uh, make the example a bit more homely. You know, we think we can somehow ignore nature, don't we? We think we can somehow bypass the laws of nature. We can, for example, produce convenience foods. Um, we can. Uh, I'll get away from working on the land. It's extraordinary how we've divorced ourselves from nature. Not many of us even wear woolen and cotton clothes these days, all synthetic, isn't it? We almost forget what, what wool is and where it comes from. And, Forget what fruit in its season actually is. The supermarkets have the same fruit 12 months of the year, don't they? Um, we somehow substitute a world of man for the natural man. And of course, the most natural thing for man is to be close to God. There's nothing more natural than that. That may sound absolute bonkers to some of my listeners. What do you mean by that, they'll say. Well, God's sort of gone so far out of our experience, especially. We think we can make the world better by electing another government or something, don't we? Or coming up with more libertarian ideas about one thing or another. Um, well, right, we do that if we bypass, bypass the God or bypass the, the authority of God, we live with the consequences. And that's really, I suppose, what this chapter's about at, at its worst. 
the, uh, the inhumanity of man to man knows no limit. We like to think we're, uh, we're living an enlightened life. But my God, think of the consequences of it. Think of the consequences, consequences on the natural ecology of the world, what we've done. Oh, how for half the world to be live comfortably, the other half is impoverished. So, you know, you've only got to scratch the surface to find deep, deep, uh, deep, deep. Uh, how can I put it deep, deep? Um, inconsistencies with, with the, with the sort of accepted view. This, this, uh, this chapter, is this place, and it's almost unbelievable what communism did. Yet communism, no doubt, started off with the best will in the world. You see, it was to remedy the injustices of this world. It's going to make the world a better place. Uh, no doubt the early people that do socialism, you really. see socialism still a big power in the world today, isn't it? The socialists are very keen on somehow making the world a more fair and equitable place, more just place. An old saying, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. Um, well, if some people don't agree, that's the trouble. Then, of course, things can get a bit aggressive. Well, we know better. It should be like this. And before you were, know where you are, you've got conflict. It can be very unpleasant. In the traditionalists and the new thinkers, the new age thinkers. Um, well, in communism, this spilled over into an absolute dreadful civil war. Nobody knows how many millions. There was about half the population of Russia was lost. Unbelievable. How many millions, including my own family. And in particular, the church, which of course was the, was the main sort of um, God-centered uh, organization, um, was singled out to be annihilated. The only way to do that was to cart all this church personnel off to some remote place and either, either shoot them or work them to death. At least if you worked them, at least you got something out of them before they died. Mass graves, God knows. <laughs> Just dig, dig, dig a great pit and shove them in by the thousand. John, what was your um, inspiration to go on this pilgrimage? And what would you say was your big um, takeaway? I loved Russia. I could not love her because Russia's my own kith and kin. And all these things that happened in Russia are in me. I recognized it, my own struggles with myself. I'm very Russian. Um, I'm really more Russian than English. Mother was Russian. And I just wanted to be there with her. I just wanted to, to drink as deeply as I could of all that had happened in Russia and to share her suffering, to share her burdens, as well as her glories. And there are glories, great glories in Russia, the best and the worst. And um, it's a funny thing, love, you know, love seeks to share in the traumas of the beloved, doesn't it? Love wants to take on the, you know, if your dog is ill, you want to be sick by it, you, you'd, you'd do anything for your little dog, wouldn't you? You to spend money on it, give it your love, you sit up all night comforting it if you could help. I felt that way about Russia. 
it's much bigger than a little dog, of course. It was a great country. But I just wanted to take all this suffering into my own heart and somehow bear it, help bear the cross. That's what it was, to help bear Russia's cross. That's right. I'm glad I did. It's one of the best things I did. And then at this time, I was already um, <clears throat> learning the work of prayer, you see. And that's exactly what prayer does. Prayer takes the horrors of this world and submits them to God. And so relief comes. That's exactly what happens, you see. Um, and there's no greater power in this world. Again, this may seem silly to those of you who, for whom you haven't reached this point in your spiritual experience, but I assure you it is. Um, but anyway, I suppose it seemed ever more appropriate that but these awful things that happened in the name of Godlessness should finally be redeemed by the opposite, by submitting them to God. Um, what does that do? Well, again, I'm going to, I'm going to rather leave this place and wander off, which may not be appropriate to. But you see, what is reality? What is real? How real is this world? I'm at the point now where I'm, I'll die soon. And it's very, very obvious to me that, that my mortality, the John Butler, the, the man you see on the screen talking to you, will soon die. But what about what's left? You see, this is the, this is the important bit, not what's going to happen to this. It's what's left. Now, in other videos, I've talked a lot about this. You see, this... <laughs> It's almost like a, a butterfly coming out of its cocoon, you see. This is the emergence of what's called immortal life or spirit after its imprisonment in the flesh. And in a way, that happens to all these people in Sol of Keys. You know, prayer isn't really so much changing the worldly condition as recognizing that the worldly condition isn't as real as you think and that there is this spiritual um, this spiritual essence of life in everything every flower every person which is untouched by you see the, the, the happenings to the flesh when you raise it to God you you, you recognize the immortal spirit in, in the in the mortal man. You've got a bit of a puzzled look on your face, Nicola. I think <laughs> I'm getting into deep water here, aren't I? But um, it is, you know, a pilgrimage is much more than just a geographical um, exploration of time and time and place. It, it, it gets you thinking. Why, 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 why do these happen? What is sanctity? What is sin? And what is our what is our duty? What is our real purpose? What am I here for? What what's what's our purpose? You know, pilgrimage is you you're given examples and not always of of these uh these extermination camps with all sorts of human conditions you see um, holy men of the past have lived and struggled and they're ever so instructive i've learned ever so much from i've been on many pilgrimages both in russia and well not so many here in england but a few but in russia pilgrimage is taken very very seriously and it's a it's a main part of uh, of any believing Russian, how they spend their summer. Um, I tried to go on at least one, if not more, pilgrimage. 
when I suppose my whole years, my periods in life, the year, years I lived in Russia were a sort of extended pilgrimage in that way. I find this um, very helpful, John. How real is, you know, this world really? Yeah. Exactly, exactly. On, yeah. um, on page 225, it kind of ties into this. If you write, it can be misleading to equate religion too closely with truth. Yeah. At best, it's but indicative a mixture of human sin and divine origin like every other child of man and subject to error and destruction yes indeed yes as history shows church medicine is only too capable of being its own monster of pride and persecution yes the true church is not a creature of earthly material and human speech at all. It's no more its earthly body and thoughts than I am mine. Gosh, I, I wrote that a long, long time ago. Yes. <laughs> That's what are oh, these things, these paper tigers? What were this? Honestly. I, I, I now in old age, I look back on my childhood, for example, where is it? I can't find it. Where, where is it? Where is it gone? <laughs> where are my years of being a, a strong farmer, you know, striding around with cow muck on my boots and, uh, you know, <laughs> able to do anything? I thought, <laughs> oh, where is it? It's gone, isn't it? And what about those? Screams of torture victims and those northern forests, where are they? Where's it gone? A few bones lie mouldering in the ground. What are those poor boys that cut their, cut their fingers off in desperation for a gambling debt? Where's it all gone? What's happened to it? Is it floating around in the cosmos somewhere? God knows. All I know is that in this simple act of what I call prayer, somehow taking this whole, in, this whole sort of impossible, in this whole inexplicable, <laughs> inexplicable, <laughs> whatever we call mankind, <laughs> and somehow, and just looking into this infinite, no thing that we call God. Somehow, it just helps. Somehow, it all just falls away, falls back to earth, doesn't it? Not as real as it was. And this, in, and you was replaced by this infinite. It's quite, quite extraordinary, you know, how after a long life of spiritual work, how this invisible world becomes a million times more real than the visible world. You come to see that this visible world is a sort of dead crystallization of the real world, which is spirit. It's, you know, our focus is the wrong way around. We think that matter is real. And so of course it matters, doesn't it? It matters terribly whether, whether you do this or that. But, but when you get beyond matter into spirit, it doesn't matter at all. Matter is a transient thing. It's like dust, dust in the ground. It just blows hither and thither. Like me. <laughs> the body just matters less every day now. You know. You know, rather pathetic events to prolong life. This latest medical research and hooray, we've solved this or that, and we're all going to live another month or two, year or two. It's laughable, really. It's so much not the point. The real point is to prepare for our transition, you see, to eternal life. That's what matters. Turn to God. 
and uh, I suppose in some way, we, if we do that, uh, I don't quite know how it works, yes, but I know there's nothing better I can do to help the world, serve serve the world. I really like that. I don't believe I can help, but maybe I can serve. I felt that in Russia, I really did. After I'd been living there some years, I started, uh, I think I felt I received an instruction actually to go and pray. I suddenly realized this is the work I really want to do. Been doing it ever since. So maybe I am following my inspiration as a boy from those hermits in the cave. It, it's just that I'm in the world and not all alone in a cave. I'm sort of alone, really. Alone, but not alone. Merged into this infinite. John, wouldn't you say that um, we're all alone? I suppose it depends from what point of view you are looking and asking that question. You see, if your reality is the is the social world, well, then you know if you we used to go to dances when when I was young. Uh, and started rather formal for social affairs there, and uh, and girls didn't dance on their own. The girls would sit around the the, the wall and not wait for a young man to come up and ask them to dance. And I was taught to go up to a girl and say, "May I have the pleasure of this dance?" And if she was a gracious girl, she'd stand, say, "Thank you, stand up, take my hand, and we would go and dance." Can you believe it? How many people would do that now? They'd laugh at you and say, <laughs> the girls are more likely to, to choose their partners. But when I was young, it was the other way around. And, um, uh, oh, yes. And, and <laughs> it was always rather unfortunate because not all the girls got asked. And if you, if they didn't get asked, they were sitting there or sort of waiting for someone to come and ask them. They were called a wallflower rather unkindly. And... Uh, Yes, nobody wanted to be a wallflower. Um, a bit cruel, really, but it's how it was then. Sorry, what was your question, dear? Oh, yes, to be alone. Yes, of course. Yes, it must have been dreadful then, being alone. I, I often felt alone because I sort of couldn't join in, really, most of the... I said I could have joined him. I didn't want to. I just felt I didn't really, it wasn't my thing and I didn't belong. Perhaps because I was part Russian, I didn't really understand it at the time. So I think that's a reason why for much of my young life I felt so alone. It's just different. I look at the immigrants now, people of different color and, and race. Also, you know, it's one thing for politicians to say we're all equal, but human behavior doesn't necessarily follow, does it? And I know only too well what it is to be a, you know, different in a society that thinks otherwise, really. I've lived most of my life like that. I feel when I see young immigrants sort of wandering around trying to do what they think is the right thing. Not so easy, is it? Whatever the rules say, the outer rules. A nice phrase in the Bible where we, uh, human, human, humanity are described as strangers and pilgrims in this world. I like that. I think I guess I've always felt a bit of a stranger in this world. I don't really belong here. I'm not really... Don't really sort of believe in the world's values. I 
you people don't understand me. I'm not really wanted in this world. You know, some people are all sort of, you know, social and drinking and being jolly and how much of it is just pretense. I think most of it is probably pretense, isn't it? We can put on a good act, can't we? We can fool others, we can fool ourselves. Not many people look deeply into their souls, do they? And get by. That's when, when people come to death, they're afraid of it. They don't want to die. Do their best to postpone the inevitable. They hang on to the structures of this life. Probably to answer your question, yes, deep down in our hearts, we're all alone because, because we're not at home. You see, we're not, we've left our home. This is the cause of this whole, this is why we die. This is sin. I think until we, we come back to God, come back to home, we are, as it's, the Bible says, strangers and pilgrims in this world. We don't really belong here. The famous words of Saint Augustine, when he writes, Thou hast made us for thyself, and the heart of man is restless until he finds his rest in thee. Profoundly true, isn't it? Sooner or later, my dears, most of us find we need God. even if it's only on your deathbed. Or when you're screaming out your last breath. What's it all for otherwise? Or is it all just for nothing? There's a sentence, John, a sentence, John, on page 226 that I think I triple highlighted it and I must have read it 20 times, but it really hits home. You write, the more we open ourselves to union, the more we bear the sins of others too. It's no use blaming them for they are me. Yes. Where's that? It's on page 226 in the second chapter. Second paragraph. Second paragraph, sorry. Yeah. Yes. They are me. Yes, I really felt that in Russia. I felt there's nothing really, as I said earlier on, of the glories or the horrors of Russia that, that are not a reflection of myself including the abominable cruelties that have happened there. By God, what we're not capable of within ourselves under certain circumstances, you know. A um, lot of these things are avoided in our normal sort of civilized life. We're not exposed to the awful rawness of life. It's when you're on the last legs of survival. You can do all sorts of things you thought you never would. Eat a dead rat. Fight over. Those are the stories told about Solovki, how the prisoners would murder each other to eat a dead rat. When you get that hungry, what, what, what won't we do? Happened in in Poland during the German, the, the Jews and the Jewish the German concentration camps. I'm sure, it's happened throughout history, every country. What we won't do. 
to each other and to nature, to animals, whatever comes within our power. And then there's more, and on the other hand, we can, we've all got this marvelous sanctity, the self sacrificing love to give ourselves for others, advise ourselves without hesitation. Amazing stories of love come out of wars. What man, what one man will do for his comrades. Die for another, die for each other without hesitation. We are such a we're such a mix, aren't we? We're such extremes of one thing or another. It's certainly good to go to these sort of places just to be reminded of the extremes of human of, of our humanity. We lead such sheltered lives. We read about starvation and that, but it's until you see it face to face, it doesn't seem too real, does it? It's just something that happens to other people in other countries. And then how real is it? Is it all just a nightmare? Is it all just a dream? It passes away. What is real? These are great questions that we need to face. Who and what is John Butler? Or is he just a passing phenomena, just a little wave on the ocean of life. Here today and gone tomorrow. Is there anything you'd like to add john before we wrap it up what can i say my dears except just turn as i keep telling you these days to turn into this you see turn from the separate from the separate and the temporal into the one eternal and some is in that infinite absorption into what becomes ever more clear to me now is the love, the love of God. I feel ever more confident now using that term, the love of God. To begin with, I used to call it terms like absolute or the infinite or the infinite consciousness. But all these things I seem to have grown out of now. It seems ever more like It's really the love I've been seeking all my life. The love that we get little drops of it, little reflections of it in this life. And these are what keep us going somehow. These seem the most worthwhile things we experience in life. It's like finding the, the source from which they all come, the infinite love. It's, you know, in my last years, I just the entire motivation, I think, these days, just to Uh, I don't drown, it's the opposite of drowning, I come to life, it's, a, it's that sense of total surrender into that infinite love. That's it. 
what it's all about. At least in my experience. And I couldn't wish anything better for all of us, every all of you. And even these those awful dramas of what's happened in this world are somehow taken up into those loving arms. There was a, just on the radio um, earlier on today, I was having lunch, I was listening, and they were talking about uh, St. Francis, that well-known Italian monk, uh, or saint. And at one time, he, he loved Jesus so much that he was imprinted with the signs of the cross on his hands and feet. And um, I think there was a painting painted, uh, I forget exactly what the narrator was saying, but um, he, 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 she, there was a picture painted of this man, St. Francis, being held and cuddled by an angel. I suppose a woman angel, like a, child, like a mother might hold her child, her baby. Um, I absolutely love that. It's, it's sort of what I've always felt, myself, longed for in a way myself, that, that some after the trials of this life, one, the sort of the comfort of a woman expanded and sublimated into the into the this infinite comfort of, of God. I don't I, I can't bear the way um, a lot of of uh, love sexual relationship these days is sort of cheapened and vulgarized and made common. I think it's 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 terribly sad because you're missing the missing the point of it really, which is sublime, sacred, and it's uh, it's really deeply, deeply symbolic of the divine comfort that, that uh, is the reality behind all this world. I think more traditionally, in more traditional um, periods of history, when uh, when women have been more objects of reverence, when there was more distinction between the, the uh, essential nobility and validity of man and woman as distinct in the, in the heavenly order. Um, and uh, and uh, I was brought up to reverence women. I've never regretted it really. I think it's uh, helped me very much in life. Although that's one of the many things that's made me feel a misfit in this model, modern world. Because of course at that time, women were, were also brought up to, to receive it, to, uh, it was expected. Uh, so both sides, both men and women were sort of um, brought up in, in, this, in this way. Well, of course, not always at that high level brought down, of course, but at its best. Yes. So ultimately, I wonder if any of you seen in, uh, I forget which town in Italy, there's a wonderful sculptor of by Michelangelo called the Pieta, Pity the Pity, which we chose after Jesus was crucified, lying on his mother's lap. And the uh, wonderful love, the compassion in her eyes as she bent her head of her son's body. It takes this whole God, talk about the nobility of woman. Can you see that? Something like that must have been, must have happened to St. Francis. Far from me to myself in the same position, but I feel this the end of my life after all the mess I've made of it, all the mistakes I've made, all the wounds I've collected, somehow to come to this infinite comfort as so though being held in the arms of love. 
there isn't a woman there, but it's sort of it's a spirit. But anyway, it doesn't seem to be much different. I think the two sort of merge together, really. When the physical woman becomes a spiritual woman, I'm not sure. I think the two pretty much run into one into the other. I wouldn't know where one ends and one begins. I suppose when you see beauty, that's sort of like a, what is beauty? It's like seeing the, the spiritual, the physical, isn't it? The light. Isn't it? At the end of it all, we are comforted, we are brought home. And I don't know whether we ever understand the purpose for all this pain, but maybe we do. Maybe it's just the price of sin. As Jesus was crucified for sin, so we somehow bear the pain for others. That's what it is, I think. I used to feel that with my farm animals when I went with them to the butcher. I felt I could bear their pain, their fear. Somehow make it easier for them. What love does. Sorry, I'm going on too long. God bless you all.